Praise the Lord. Welcome to the Revivalist broadcast originating from River of Life Church in Pekin, Illinois of the United States of America. We come to you today with a vision burning within us to proclaim the whole counsel of God and the full power of the Holy Spirit. And as we begin, I wanted to share one thing with you, that if you have any prayer requests, any, any concerns that you'd like, we have intercessors here, we have intercessory prayer groups. And simply send your needs in to us. We'll be glad to pray over them. We'll believe God for a miracle in your life. Send them into our email address, which is the revivalist1234 at yahoo.com. Let me repeat that. It's the revivalist1234 at yahoo.com. Praise God. We're going to go to John chapter 15. As we've been studying the last couple, three weeks that we've been doing this broadcast, what I've been trying to accomplish, what the Lord's given to me to do, is to, to just paint a portrait of a revival church. And I've shared it in the past couple of broadcasts how I came to the Lord and I was asking God to show me a revival church. And then he, he spoke to me in a dream and told me to come back to the church that I was pastoring and teach through John chapter 15. And I just, I understood in my spirit that what I was getting ready to teach had something to do with revival, but I didn't quite see it. And as I began to progress and to go through that chapter, the Lord began to minister to me and show me even times when I was teaching, times when I was preaching, times when I was praying for people. He began to show me how John chapter 15 was very much an outline of a revival church. So I began to go through that verse by verse by verse and look at all of the different ways that it talked about things that would be a revival church as we see that come into manifestation. Uh, just a kind of a, a quick review and verse number one, we looked at how that Jesus is the true vine. And if we're a revival church, we have to be plugged into the true vine. We have to be plugged into Jesus as our source. And as I begin to just teach that, and I've taught it here a little bit lately, quite a bit actually, and uh, I've meditated on it quite a bit, and the Lord's really been speaking to me about that. And that Jesus is not just a source, but Jesus is our source. Jesus is not just a source, but Jesus is the only source. And that's one of the key things that we're learning in John chapter 15. As a matter of fact, he says in a, a verse a little bit later, verse 5, I believe it is, that without him, we could do nothing. He says, without me, you can do nothing. And that sounds to me like he's saying that he's our only source. I, you know, I'm using a microphone today, and this microphone has a couple batteries in it. And if I take those batteries out of it, then without the, those batteries, this microphone cannot do anything. And that's kind of what Jesus is saying. Without me as your power source, without me as your only source, you can do absolutely nothing. As I began to think about that, I thought, you know, about how the Bible tells us in, in Philippians chapter 4, I, I believe it's verse 6, he tells us that to be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known unto God. So if he's telling us there to pray about everything, then apparently he wants us to be relying on him and trusting him as our source for all things. If I'm praying about everything, then apparently he wants me to be hit my source for all things. And so that's one of the great lessons that I'm learning as I walk with God throughout these years. And, and the Lord has been progressively showing me that more and more and more as time goes on, of course. But in the last month or two here lately, the Lord has really impacted me with that reality, how he is my only source for all things. That's what the Apostle Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, when he says, For I determined to know, not to know anything, among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. In other words, he is the means of our provision for all things. Not only for right now, but throughout all eternity, Christ is the means of our provision of everything we ever receive from God. I uh, was praying this morning, and, and during my morning prayer time, it just, it's just been kind of a battling time, kind of a struggling time, it seems like. Just some real battles going on in the spirits, some battles going on in my heart, and just as I was laying before the Lord in prayer, it just seemed like I felt so troubled. 
And as I began to think about it, and I just began to look at that verse, that I'm determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I just began to praise Him and thank Him that He's my source and that all of my provision and all these answers to prayer come through Christ and Him crucified. And as I began to just thank Him for that and focus on that and praise Him for that, then the Spirit of God just brought a tremendous peace over me, a tremendous comfort as I began to just worship God for that simple little truth that He is my answer. He is my provision. He is my source. It's not my ability. It's not my strength. It's not my knowledge. It's not what I do. But it's as I put my faith in Christ and Him crucified, as I look to Him as my only true source, and that peace just flooded my heart, and that peace just flooded my spirit, I began to just worship Him and thank Him. As a, as a that storm just kind of came to be nice, peaceful calm as I looked upon Christ and Him crucified. You see, beloved, that's the one thing that we've got to understand, that our total dependence upon Christ is going to bring perfect peace and security to our life and to our heart and to our spirit. I believe that we can kind of grasp that idea if you begin to think about the Word of God and to realize that every single word in here is promised to you is yours and belongs to you through Christ and Him crucified. And if you begin to meditate upon the Word of God, you'll find tremendous peace will come to your heart. Tremendous peace will come into your spirit as you rest in the Word of God, as you rest in the promises of God, being assured, being assured that the victory of every single promise has already been won through Christ and Him crucified, signed, sealed, and delivered by the blood of Jesus Christ. I uh, began to think about that again, it's just that, that perfect peace of dependence, that perfect security of dependence. And I began to think, imagine a child that grew up in a home, and I go back a little bit of time, and, and I know this probably doesn't apply much, at least here in the United States anymore, but as I grew up as a child, especially my grandparents' generation, they were very rigid about meal times. I mean, they had each meal at a certain time, and everybody in the family was expected to be there at the dinner table or the breakfast table or whatever it might be. And we, they would typically have, of course, three meals a day. And you might have one at, say, 7 a.m., and the next one might be at 12 noon, and then the next one was 5 p.m., and, and whatever that capacity might be. But the one thing that I always knew that when it became time for breakfast and I went to that table, there was food there. When it became time for lunch and I, I went to that table, there was food there. When it became time for dinner, when I went to that table, there was food there. And as a child, I always knew that, that at my grandparents' home, my grandparents' house, the idea of not having food never occurred to me. The idea of not having food on that table when I went there, and usually there was an abundance of food. Usually there was more food than I needed, obviously, and there was probably too much food for all of us there. But I had a sense of security, and the idea never occurred to me that I might go to that table at noon someday and there not be any food there. And I began to think that, you know, that, that, that was total dependence as a child upon them to feed me. A total dependence upon them as a child to meet my physical needs. But yet, as I had that total dependence and that total trust and that total assurance, I always had complete security. And I thought, you know, that's what our walk is with the Lord. When we realize that we have His Word here. And when we, when we look at His Word and realize we can trust this Word to always come to pass. Whatever God promises, we can believe and trust and it's going to come to pass because our Heavenly Father has spoken it and Jesus Christ has paid the price and made provision for the victory of every single promise. Every single word in there is provided through Christ and Him crucified. When we can re learn to rely and depend upon that, then we're going to walk in perfect security and we're going to walk in perfect peace just like I was that moment in prayer when I just began to thank Him and praise Him for His provision through Christ and Him crucified. That peace just rose up in my heart and that peace just took, took charge so to speak of my spirit and just flooded me. That's how God wants us to live. Walking in that dependence and that trust and that faith in the works of Jesus Christ that every single promise in here, every single promise of provision will come to pass and we can trust our Heavenly Father in that capacity. As a matter of fact, there was a time that Jesus was teaching on prayer and he even said something that, you know, if, if you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Heavenly Father 
father. Well, if we as men and women, and we understand to provide for our children, and, and, our, and my grandparents understood to always have food on the table, how much more is my heavenly father going to be, be sure to fulfill every single promise in his word? He's already sent his son, Jesus Christ, to pay the price and make provision through the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the ascension to the right hand of the father of Jesus Christ to, to seal every single promise with his blood. How much can we truly trust that and walk in dependence upon Christ and him crucified and the covenant that we have with him? And that, beloved, is the key to walking in perfect peace and perfect security is to put our hearts upon him and the works of Jesus Christ to meditate and walk in the word of the living God and to trust him, to trust him, to trust him to bring it to pass. As a matter of fact, he says that he watches over his word to perform it. God performs his word. I don't perform his word. God performs his word. You don't perform his word. What we do is simply trust it. What we do is put our faith in the works of Jesus Christ and God will then bring it to pass. There was a, a king in the Old Testament, his name was Asa. And I've always used him as an example for many things because years ago as I studied that particular chapter, 2 Chronicles chapter 16, the Lord used that example greatly to minister to me. And in, in, that, in the account of Asa, Asa was a, a king and he, he seen some great victories and tremendous things come to pass, but then he began to... to to, to think worldly apparently and he went into the king of Syria and he took, he took wealth and riches out of God's house and gave it to the king of Syria to enter into covenant with that king so that whoever came against Asa, the king of Syria would assist him. Whoever came against Syria, then the Asa would also assist him. In other words, he had taken his faith out of God and the promises of God and now he was placing his faith in this worldly covenant. As a result of that, Asa then immediately began to see defeat in battle. And God even sent a prophet to him, and the prophet told him that, you know, when you put your trust in God, you walked in victory, but now you're in an covenant with this king of Syria, and now you're seeing defeat. Maybe you ought to understand that, Asa. That ought to be pretty obvious. And told him that the eyes of the Lord go to and fro in search of those whose heart is perfect toward him, that he might show himself strong in their behalf. And that word there, perfect toward him, means totally and completely trusting him. And so God has given us a promise there. If we totally put all of our trust and all of our faith in Him, then we're going to see victory. But when we enter into league and covenant and try to do it the world's way, then we're only going to see defeat. As a matter of fact, God said in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 2, verse 13, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Now, it, it may seem shocking, but in that verse, God says to put our trust elsewhere is an evil thing. God said to look elsewhere as a source is an evil thing. And we might say, boy, that, that sounds harsh, Lord. That, that seems very harsh, God. Why is it if I just simply look at something else as my source, why would that be considered evil? Well, let's take, for example, a marriage covenant. You have a man and a woman married, and they're in covenant to one another. Would it be okay for that woman to go meet her emotional needs with another man? Would it be okay for her to go meet her physical needs with another man? Of course not. Why? Because she's in covenant. And she would be breaking covenant at that time. God is a covenant God. And when we're in covenant with God, He's our source. And we're to look at Him as our source for all things. And that's exactly what Jesus is teaching us in the parable of the branch and the vine in John chapter 15. That vine is the source. We're simply branches, and the vine is the source. We only have one source, and that is the true vine. That is Jesus Christ. And as we put our trust in Him, and if we put all of our faith in Him, then we see the provision coming forth into our life. And beloved, why would, I would ask you, why would you ever need another source other than God? Is God not sufficient? Is He not able is he not capable of doing whatever needs to be done? Is he not able and capable of moving in whatever situation you're in? Why would you ever even think about needing another source when you have the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the almighty God, the all-powerful one who can raise the dead and speak to lame legs and they walk and open blind eyes and deaf ears? Why would you need another source other than that? There was a time in the Old Testament when, when the Israelites had turned their hearts to idolatry and they came to God and they say and they began to call upon God. God said, no, go talk to your idols. Go talk to your wooden statues and see if they can meet your needs. 
Well, sometimes that's what we do as believers. We turn from the all-powerful God and we turn to some kind of worldly source that can't be a source anyway and can't move and can't meet our needs in the first place. Beloved, Jesus Christ is the all-sufficient source. We don't need any other answers. Hallelujah. You know, that's the introduction to verse 1. Verse 2 tells us that a revival church is purged to bear fruit. Purged. In other words, things are cut away so that all the energy and all the resources can go forth into bearing more fruit and more fruit and more fruit. There's a verse in the Bible, he Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 says, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Now we understand, of course, that sin's going to defeat us, but it also says there every weight. Now I always think about when I read that, I always think about days back, a long, long time ago when I was in the military and we would go out on marches and, you know, you have your rifle and you have your knapsack and your canteen and that stuff on you. I don't remember now what the total weight of all of that is, but it's not very much. And you start out and you think, well, this, this rifle's light and this knapsack doesn't have that much in it. This canteen, you know, it's not too much weight, but after about 10 or 15 miles, all of a sudden that rifle's very heavy. All of a sudden, that knapsack is very heavy. All of a sudden, even that canteen seems like it weighs a thousand pounds because you're getting tired and, and you're getting weary and you're just kind of wearing down. And that's what it's talking about spiritually. If we're carrying weight with us, then we're going to weary down. We're going to wait. We're going to weary and faint, as the Bible refers to it. So we've got to make sure that we don't have extra weight that we're carrying with us. The Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians chapter 3 is one of my favorite passages. And he talks about, he counts everything as lost that he might gain Christ. And counts everything that done that he might know Jesus. And he just lays down everything in his life. Anything in his life that would be a weight that would beset him. Anything in his life that would be a weight that would hinder him. He's willing to lay down so he can press on to the high calling in Christ Jesus. I was yesterday in... I was in my prayer time and in my prayer closet and talking to the Lord and, and just talking to him about revival and some of the things that I've been talking about lately with him and, and asking him to show me. And I began to Lord, it seems like so often we're, we're hindered in revival. We're hindered in revival. And I was thinking about that passage, how Paul had just really laid down everything. He'd forsaken everything, no matter what it was. If it hindered his walk with God, he didn't want it in his life. And, and the Lord began to speak to me about that, beloved. One of the things that greatly hinders us in our pursuit of revival is sometimes just the comfort, comforts and pleasures of this world. If we're satisfied with this world, we're not truly going to be seeking the face of God. If we're satisfied and comfortable with the things of this world, and we're not going to be like Paul pressing into the high calling of Christ Jesus. Beloved, we need to do that. We need to be purged and to examine our lives and, and ask the Lord, Lord, is there weight in my life? Is there things that are holding me back and hindering me from pursuing you? Is there things in my life that are hindering me from seeking your face, Lord, and calling out upon you? And, and allow the Holy Spirit to, to search our hearts and allow the Holy Spirit to examine our lives and point things out to us and say, no, that right there, that weight is, is weighing you down. Down and that way it is weighing you down and, and lay things down that might be hindering our pursuit of God. Beloved, we need to press in and seek the fullness of God. We need to press in and seek the glory of God and not to be satisfied with the comforts of this world and not to be satisfied with the pleasures of this world, beloved. We need to be pressing in every day, every single day, seeking the fullness of God, seeking Him in prayer, seeking Him in His Word, seeking Him in worship, and not allowing any earthly weights to hold us back. The Bible tells us too in John chapter 15 when we, we come to verse number 3, it's right along that same line. It says, Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. The word of God cleans us up. You know, the Bible tells us in, in Isaiah chapter 55, he says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways are not my ways, and, and heaven is higher than the earth, and so are my ways higher than your ways, and he goes on and, and gives us the example in Isaiah 55 of the rain coming down and the, and the seed in the earth budding and bringing forth the harvest and, and tells us that his word will, will not return void, but it's going to accomplish and prosper that which he sent it into. But you see, there's part of that that we, can't, we, we tend to kind of skip over. And that's in verse 7. It says, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. So we need to sometimes forsake the way we think. 
Sometimes we need to forsake the ways that we have and allow the word of God to clean up our life. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, that we're to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And a lot of times people talk about that and, and look at it in the context. Oh yeah, I've got to meditate in the word. And we do. And I've got to focus on the word. And I've got to put God's word in my heart. And all of that's 100% true. But part of renewing something is also getting rid of the old. If you're going to renew a building, you, 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 you have to tear some things down and, and, and get rid of some things before you put the new on. And that's what the part of that renewing process is. One of the things that we have to do is a, the, thing, the way that we think, if it doesn't line up with God's word, be ready to cast down those imaginations. Things in our life that don't line up with God's word, get rid of them. We have to allow the word of God to cleanse us in our thinking, cleanse us in our heart, cleanse our homes, cleanse our lifestyle, cleanse our churches, cleanse our ministries. If we're truly going to be a revival church, then we have to allow the Word of God to do its cleansing work. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that the glorious church that Jesus talks about coming for is a church that has been washed and cleaned by the washing of the water of the Word. So we have to allow the worship of the water of the word, the anointed word of God, to do its work in our life and be willing to allow that to accomplish those purposes in our life. I, I use so often the example in uh, Matthew chapter 7 of two houses. And one is built upon rock and one's built upon sand. And the one that's built upon rock is the one that when the storms come, it still stands. The one that's built upon sand is when the storm comes, it falls. And the difference, like I said, the one built upon rock, hears the word of God and does it. Hears the word of God and allows it to clean up their life. Hears the word of God and allows it to clean up the way they think. The other ones are those who hear the word of God, but don't allow it to accomplish its purpose in their life. Don't allow it to clean up the way they think. Don't allow it to clean up the way they live. They're hearing it, but they're not allowing it to impact their lives. Beloved, if we're going to be a revival people in these last days, and revival church in these last days, we've got to allow the Word of God to do its cleansing work in our life. But I want to share with you one last thought today, that how we do that. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 22 says, seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit. Now, three things I, I want to qualify there real quick. First of all, the word souls. We understand that we're three-part beings. We're spirit, soul, and body. The spirit part of man is that internal part of man. The spirit of God witnesses to our spirit that we are his child. The soul, as the Bible is referring to there, is, is basically our, our intellect, our emotions, our will. And then our body, of course, is this flesh that you, you see standing before the camera right here today. So it's understand that important there that he's talking about the soul, renewing the way we think, renewing the way we feel, renewing the changes that we make, purifying the way we think, purifying the way we feel, purifying the decisions we make. That's a, what the Word of God is there to do. It says the truth. The truth is the Word of God. John chapter 17 says to sanctify them through the truth. Thy Word is truth. And if you'll notice that there's a key phrase there, through the Spirit. We don't obey the Word of God by our willpower. We don't obey the Word of God by our strength. We don't obey the Word of God by our ability. We obey the Word of God by the power of the Holy Spirit. And let me share real quick with you. There was a time in my life when, when, I, when I first came to Christ and the Lord delivered me from drugs and the Lord delivered me from alcohol. But I had a problem getting rid of nicotine and I struggled with that for a long time. And I would get frustrated, and I was under conviction about it, trying to lay it down, pick it up, lay it down, pick it up, lay it down, pick it up. One day I got so frustrated with the Lord, I said, God, what is going on here? I, you, you, I, you delivered me from drugs, and you delivered me from alcohol, but Lord, I can't stop these cigarettes. I can't stop this nicotine. And the Lord stopped me in my tracks right there, and he says, that's the problem. You look to me to deliver you from drugs. You look to me to deliver you from alcohol, but you're trying to quit cigarettes. You see what had happened? I was trying to do the Word of God in my willpower and in my strength. Beloved, we don't do that. We look to God. We look to Jesus Christ and Him crucified as we place our faith there. That it's like tapping that rock in the wilderness. The floods and the waters of the Holy Spirit come out and empower you and I to live the Word of God. Empower you and God to walk in the Word. Just like the lady with the issue of blood. When she touched the hem of Jesus' garment, the anointing flowed out of Him. And that's what we're doing. We're reading the Word of God. This is what God wants me to do. This is God's guideline. I put my faith in Jesus Christ and I trust the power of the Holy Spirit to enable me to walk out the Word of God. In other words, let me paraphrase that real quick. 
See, you have purified your emotions, intellect, and will in obeying God's word. Through placing your faith in Christ and him crucified and receiving the power of the Holy Spirit to live accordingly. Beloved, lift up your eyes unto Jesus. He is your only source and he is a source that can provide anything you need today in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise God. The Bible tells us in Luke 6, 38, Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over. Shall men give unto your bosom, for with the same measure that you meet with all it shall be measured to you again. One of the great financial blessings of the Lord is we learn that as we give, we receive. As we give liberally, then we receive liberally. Bring in the harvest liberally. So we want to give you the opportunity to give into this ministry, to partner with us, to proclaim the whole counsel of God in the full power of the Holy Spirit. If you'd like to send in an offering, please send that to River of Life Church, 246 Derby Street, Pekin, Illinois, 61554, United States of America. Let me repeat that address. River of Life Church, 246 Derby, Pekin, Illinois, 61554, United States of America. God bless you. Oh.